I'd like to begin by just having the pleasure of introducing one aspect of the future that I was describing. Because it's being built on an historic partnership between Cruise, General Motors, the RTA, and the leaders and the people of Dubai. And the next few years, it's going to reshape and transform transportation as we all know it. Now, it started last year when I met on this same site at the Expo while it was still being built with the Crown Prince. Together, we signed an agreement that will place Dubai on the cutting edge of mobility, sustainability, and artificial intelligence. The Crown Prince's instructions that day were simple, but they were very profound. He wanted his people to be able to connect across all of Dubai more safely, more reliably, more affordably, and without polluting Dubai's skies and waterways. This is Dubai's vision, and it has now become General Motors and Cruise's mission. Now, for too long, leaders all around the world have accepted the notion that vehicle transportation has to be dangerous, and that death and injury and carnage on our roadways is the price that we have to pay to get from place to place. We assume that driving requires emitting excess carbon into our atmosphere, and we expect that roadways belong only to those who have the ability to drive or the means to secure a driver. Dubai is going to help show the world that none of this has to be true. So let me start with safety. In the United States, it's become normal that each year nearly 40,000 people lose their lives on our roads in collisions. And nearly 4.4 million people are seriously injured to a degree that affects the rest of their lives. Same is true in each and every city around the world. In fact, road fatalities in Dubai were up 20% last year. And tragically, those road injuries are now one of the leading causes of death for children in this city. Two out of three fatally injured children in the UAE are killed by road traffic crashes. It doesn't have to be this way. Dubai and Cruise have set out to change this together by removing the least reliable element in road transportation, the human driver. The most dangerous and unpredictable feature of modern automobiles is not the brakes, it's not the accelerator, it's not the heavy metal chassis, it's not the tires, it's the human driver. In the United States, over 90% of fatalities are attributed to drivers. We get sleepy, we get distracted, we get emotional. We don't see well in darkness and our vision changes over the course of our lives as do our reflexes. During the pandemic, we saw how fear and frustration change how we drive. Although cars didn't change last year, the way we drove them did. We became more aggressive and reckless and emotional. Fatalities were up 20% in both the United States and Dubai. Charges of driving under the influence rose by nearly identical amounts. So Dubai, Cruise, and GM have committed to make our roads safer by introducing cruise AVs that rely on an automated driving system. Now, for the last eight years, engineers at Cruise have been developing this ADS system into the most advanced system in the world. We've tested it on some of the most complicated and chaotic urban streets in the United States in my hometown of San Francisco. Now, today, Cruise operates the first and only fully driverless ride hail passenger service in any major city in the United States. Uh, and I'd like to show you some images of what our AVs see as they're driving through the bustling streets of San Francisco, just to give you a better idea. So our AVs, and, and the bottom part is what the AV sees, and above is kind of a representation of how it understands where it's navigating. So it's seeing the other vehicles, it's seeing the individuals, it's projecting which path they're going to take, um, and it's reacting to all of that in real time. The AVs are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've driven over you know, nearly three million miles, and we've driven over a million more hours uh, in simulated driving during the last three years. Uh, each day, the AV learns and adjusts and improves, and we review its actions, and we ensure that it's operating safely. It doesn't get tired, it doesn't get unfocused or distracted or angry or intoxicated or anything like that. The only thing it gets is better. 
And when it reaches the point where it will objectively make the streets of Dubai safer, we'll be delivering it to Dubai as our first international partner. Uh, saving lives, and just look at that. I mean, right there, recognize the stop sign being held up by the, uh, by the construction worker, waited for the other car to go through, and then navigated around the cones. So, um, saving lives is the first goal that the Crown Prince, GM, and crew shared, and achieving that alone would be enough to justify this partnership, sparing people of Dubai from death and injury on the road. But the vision that we share goes much further, and we also share a commitment to protecting our planet. So, since the dawn of automobiles, we've been burning fuels to propel them, and we've emitted gases that have damaged our environment. Particulates have clogged our lungs, they've darkened our skies, they've damaged our health. Children have developed epidemic rates of asthma from the air that we breathe, and the carbon dioxide emissions from our vehicles have imperiled the planet. Worldwide, transportation is responsible for roughly one-fifth of all the carbon emissions that are changing the Earth's climate, and about half of that comes from um, passenger cars and vans. Now, we now know that if we don't cut carbon emissions dramatically, that further climate change is going to devastate our planet. Seas will continue to rise, storms will increase in their frequency and severity, biodiversity will shrink, and water tables will become contaminated, food supplies will fall, and all of us, all humanity will suffer. I've seen that future too, in the Pacific Islands. By the end of this decade, we all need to reduce our global greenhouse gas emissions by 30% simply to limit global warming to 2 degrees Celsius, centigrade. Or else, we've got a much worse future ahead of us. We can eliminate vehicle emissions this century. The cruise fleet is 100% electric. It produces zero emissions. Zero. And this is our commitment for every one of our vehicles wherever we operate in the world. Like GM, Cruise is committed to work toward a world with zero collisions, zero deaths, and zero emissions on our roadways. Now, the first two will take a little bit longer, but we can eliminate emissions today. And that's exactly what we're doing, making Dubai safer and cleaner. The Crown Prince's vision for Dubai is also about fairness, making mobility more affordable and more accessible. You know, what are the most expensive elements of a ride hail service? You know, vehicles cost money, of course, but they pay for themselves over time just through the course of their operations. The most expensive elements of operating a car service are the cost of labor, the drivers, the cost of fuel, and the cost of insurance liability and um, repairs from collisions. So if you eliminate the cost of driving, if you reduce fuel costs down to the cost of electric charging and you reduce collisions and repair costs, you fundamentally change the cost of transportation for everyone. Over time, as the technology advances, we're going to drive these costs down further. Instead of mobility being a luxury that only some people can afford, AV ride hail will eventually offer all the people of Dubai a future in which travel becomes less expensive. Finally, Dubai and Cruise committed to make this service more reliable and accessible. You know, while many people need ride hail, some communities and some areas have difficult to, difficulty getting service. Drivers go wherever the numbers are largest and the fares are going to be highest, and the pickup and drop off is going to be easiest. That's, that's what human beings do. But cruise ABs will go where the need is, period. We will provide up to 4,000 cruise ABs by 2030, and that will meet all demand and will give equal priority to all riders. It will not just be the person who is leaving the most expensive hotels and heading the furthest distance. It's going to be that person in a less affluent area who needs to get to the hotel to do their job there. And those with disabilities that prevent them from driving, and older people who are no longer confident to drive or capable of driving. The future is a place that delivers reliable transportation for everyone. And those aren't the only benefits. For those of you today who had to wind your way through traffic to get here, you know that driving isn't always a joy. Um, you don't get to take in the sights. You don't rest your eyes. You don't read a book or have a meal or watch a movie or check your email or finish your work or 
plan your next vacation. No, when you're driving, you stare at the bumper of the car in front of you, or at the traffic light, or at the navigation system, or your fuel gauge. Now, I've driven every day of my life except for the time when I was serving as U.S. Ambassador. And I can tell you from that experience, life is a lot better in the back of the car. So once we, once we fully deploy, we can give all the people of Dubai that experience. We can give them their freedom back. And as more residents switch from personal vehicles to ride hail, we can give everyone more space. Fewer parking spaces, fewer parking garages, that all means more room for the people of Dubai to enjoy. So the decision to make Dubai our first international partner was for great reasons, but choosing Dubai was an easy choice for us. Dubai offers a vision that we share. It produces a well-educated, highly trained workforce that can help ensure that our vehicles operate safely, but most of all, Dubai's leaders are innovators. You know, not every government is prepared to do this. They're not ready for this type of change. You know, while some change is always inevitable, once in a century or so, a new innovation set um, uh, produces these powerful changes that really revolutionize the way we all live. The Industrial Revolution, Second Industrial Revolution, Digital Revolution. Most countries resist the change initially, but the countries that across the sweep of history have emerged stronger from these changes invariably were the ones who recognized the changes and seized them instead of being afraid of them. The future is here in Dubai because the leaders of Dubai are not afraid of change, they embrace it. Today, we're witnessing one of those historic moments where new technologies and global trends are providing unprecedented opportunities to improve the quality of our lives, but they are also creating fear and uncertainty in many governments. Digital technology, while it serves crucial problems, um, is creating or compounding some others. In too many parts of the world, the pace of technology has outstripped the capacity of the government to manage it. It has inflamed the rivalries between those who benefit and those who don't. And it's degraded standards of journalism, of altruism, and of civility that are necessary for us all to find common ground. We need leaders not only in business and technology, we need innovative leaders in government who can help us adapt to this great disruption. And we see that leadership here in Dubai. Humanity's been through this before. Uh, the disruptions that we're feeling around the world today, including in world politics, are nearly identical to what happened between 1870 and 1910 at the dawn of the second industrial revolution. Today, changes in technology and revolution, have revolutionized the media, global integration and demographics. Um, and we think no one else has been through what we're going through right now. In 1879, during a three-month period, both the electric light and a workable internal combustion engine were both invented. And those two inventions alone produced over the next 40 years a dizzying number of new technologies. The telephone, the phonograph, um, motion pictures, cars, airplanes, elevators, x-ray machines, electric machinery, consumer appliances, highways, suburbs, skyscrapers, all created in that 40-year burst. And it fundamentally transformed how people live, and it eventually vaulted America to the top of the world order, but it also produced some income disparities, labor unrest, mass migrations, a Great Depression, the rise of authoritarians, and two world wars. We learned some hard lessons about what happens when governments don't adapt quickly enough to keep pace with technological change. In too many other parts of the world, we've seen runaway technology and walkaway government. The pace of technological change has been exponential. The pace at which our world is being changed keeps accelerating. These changes are frightening to some people. They've paralyzed some governments, just as profound changes did 150 years ago. But the places that flourished were the ones where leaders didn't resist the change. They innovated and met the opportunity. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the World Expos were held in those cities in New York, Philadelphia, London, Chicago, my hometown of San Francisco. They helped harness technologies to solve human problems and regulate them 
to mitigate unintended effects. Now it's Dubai's time. Rather than fearing AI, Dubai has created a ministry of possibilities. I believe um, our friend um, Minister Omar al Alama uh, may be here as well. Uh, and he leads the uh, ministry of, of possibilities. Um, the RTA has embraced self-driving cars. Great technologies need great governmental partners. They always have. Driving was pure chaos. Government industry had to work together to usher in the automotive age. Those laws worked well for technology, but those laws will need to adapt to new technologies. If you're out in the hallway, you saw the origin, um, our vehicle. It doesn't have a steering wheel, it doesn't have a brake pedal, it doesn't have a gas, it doesn't have any side view mirrors. Um, we're gonna need government leaders who are okay with signing off on that machine even though it doesn't meet current standards. But that's what we found here. Dubai sees a better future. So I'd like to leave you with one final reflection before Ramia and I sit down. Um, I was born on a U.S. Army base in Germany. And when my father left the service in 1965, we flew back to the United States. It was for the first time in my life when we went to New York City. And one of my earliest childhood memories was attending the World's Fair, uh, the equivalent of our expo in New York. And GM had a ride there, it was called the Futurama, and it imagined things like astronauts landing on the moon, and submersibles exploring the ocean floor, and autonomous vehicles making discoveries across the frozen lands of the Antarctic, and rovers going across lunar surfaces. Technologies that would allow vehicles to be controlled as fleets to, making, to make driving safer. And it imagined the rise of cities like Dubai, with fresh water being pumped into desert cities where skyscrapers would rise and new visions of the future would emerge. And as a small boy in New York, I just sat in that GM auditorium at a World Expo, and I witnessed a future in which a city like modern Dubai was possible, and where self-driving GM vehicles cross superhighways to connect the people of that city together. And now, here we are in this World Expo. It is the realization of all those dreams with the men and women of Dubai who have made it happen. Dubai, GM, and Cruz have imagined the future, and now it's time to distribute it to the rest of the world. So in the US, we've got this saying, fortune favors the brave. World Expos are held in those cities that dare to dream that dare to be brave and define the future. The future is here in Dubai. And we at Cruz and GM are proud and we're very honored to be part of that future with you. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Blaish, for your brief on Cruz and its operations. We're so excited to see what develops in Dubai and I would like to ask you, first of all, about innovations like autonomous driving and expanded sharing economy. When will they enter the mainstream? When will we see them here? Um, well, we have, a, we, we have worked out an agreement with the RTA, and we're anticipating that they will be on the roads here in uh, Dubai next year. And tell us a little bit about the process uh, that we are going to see on our roads as in the lead up to that time. Well, we'll begin with um, mapping. So we will have some of our vehicles will probably be uh, Chevy Bolts uh, that are fully kitted out with all of our sensors. Uh, they will go around the city of Dubai and learn the, uh, the features of the city, um, start learning more about any differences between driving styles and laws and uh, rules here, um, and, the, and the habits of individual drivers, and we'll continue the machine learning, and then over time, uh, as we determine that we are operating at a safe level, uh, then we'll begin a uh, commercial ride hail service, and we will then migrate uh, from, from the Chevy Bolts into the Origins. And one of the things that has made us as successful as we've been is that um, we've, we've been guided by science. So instead of you know, uh, doing what a lot of other companies do, which is start in the easy areas and then try and you know, build up 
a little bit of a base and some momentum there, we decide to go to the hardest areas so you could really learn how to do this properly. Because once you've mastered that, then the easy spaces are easy. Uh, so we, we've taken our time, um, but we've moved from being um, behind other companies to ahead of everyone um, because we've taken that extra effort to be careful, to be safe, to make sure that we've mastered what we committed to do before we put um, passengers on the streets. The rule that we talk about at Cruise is I'm not going to put a car on the road until I'm prepared to put my own child in it. And you did show us a lot of statistics and share with us the uh, child mortality rates on the roads here in the UAE and in the US as well. And people inherently trust themselves more than they trust technology. You mentioned that the car on display outside has no steering wheel, has no visible brakes. How can we encourage people to really embrace autonomous driving? Uh, you know, the, the same was true with um, electric elevators. <laughs> and, you know, I, really, um, people trusted elevator operators much more than they trusted electric elevators. And over time, electric elevators got better and better, automatic elevators, and um, uh, elevator operators were not very good. And there was a lot of carnage in elevators. I won't go into the gory details of it. But uh, once people realized that it truly was safer, and that uh, then the, the change was rapid. And I think when you saw Mary Barra saying, you know, everyone's nervous the first time they hear about getting in one of these vehicles. A ghost car comes around, pulls up in front of you, and you think, I must be crazy to get inside this. And within five minutes, it's, it starts to get a little boring. It's like, okay, this is a really smooth drive. Feels like a person I trust. And that's why people tend to personalize the vehicles. You know, she was in Tostada. My favorite vehicle is Poppy. Um, but it's like a, it becomes a trusted friend. Just, I don't worry when I get in an elevator. I don't worry when I get in one of our AVs. So it's something that uh, that grows on you as time passes. Yeah, I, and I think we, um, you know, we tend to watch others. And um, you know, one of the things we've done at Cruise is we've, uh, we we started with again with the hardest people to convince, sort of older people who are like, uh, not for me. So we had a friend of mine, Willie Mays, who's a Hall of Fame baseball player, 89 years old. He's like. You got to be crazy. What are you doing now? <laughs> and I said, Why don't you try yourself? And he got in. Uh, at first, he was nervous, and then he fell asleep. <laughs> so I think, uh, so we ran that. <laughs> it's like sitting in the dentist's chair after half an hour, you get sleepy, but before you get in, your heart's beating, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Tell us, tell us a little bit about the model presented by existing um, mobility services, shared mobility services. Where are these platforms really headed, especially with new entrants as such as yours into the market? You know, I think people will always want um, different choices. And so there will be room for everything. Um, but over time, um, uh, you see this moving more and more towards um, autonomous vehicles. It's just, it, it, it's just the nature of things. You know? There are still people who love to ride horses, um, but they don't use it as a primary form of transportation. I think this is the direction that we're going with um, autonomous vehicles. and. Even many of the large rideshare companies uh, are investing in AV technology for precisely that reason. Mm -hmm. Dubai is obviously a futuristic city. It em uh, embraces innovation, and particularly the RTA. Tell us a little bit about when we will really see this truly broadly available across the Emirate. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, part of it is it's a partnership. So it's a public-private partnership, and we don't want to move faster than uh, uh, our, our partners in Dubai want us to move. Uh, but over time, I see this accelerating rapidly. So uh, we would be in you know, initial operations in 2023, and I think that um, certainly before the end of this decade, uh, this will be a very common uh, occurrence all around uh, the Emirates and around the world. Looking forward to seeing that. You mentioned um, the previous transport revolution. How will policy evolve for this, this next um, transport revolution? Um, I, in a number of different ways. I think, uh, again, no one, no one anticipated. It, it took 30 years for there to be any state in the United States that had a speed limit <laughs> after, after vehicles were on the road. At some point, people were like, folks are just going too fast. <laughs> we need to make some innovation. So there will be a lot of innovations that we haven't anticipated. But I think what you could imagine is 
initially some separation between kind of the wild, wild west of human driving and the more um, predictable AV driving where the vehicles are actually reacting to one another and, and um, can, um, uh, can actually sense one another uh, in, in a very efficient manner. Now, uh, probably could drive closer together, probably could drive at higher speeds, um, probably could, um, you know, not have to stop for some basic road signs because they will be able to sense whether there is any oncoming traffic from a greater distance. There will be those sorts of innovations that you're likely to see, as well as, you know, not requiring side view mirrors because there's no one to look at them, um, that kind of thing. Okay. Dubai is known as being um, a place where public-private partnerships are embraced and accommodated and really cheered on and supported. So I would like to know how governments co-create with the private sector in terms of sustainable transport ecosystems elsewhere. I mean, it can't be this easy outside of Dubai. No, and, and part of the reason why we came to Dubai is that, um, as I said, historically, it's been the uh, effectively city-states that have innovated. Um, ones with four, you know, forward-thinking visionary leaders, um, with a nimble government, and with a um, uh, desire to, to um, lead the world. And so there are, there are a handful of country, countries, um, mostly smaller countries, with um, uh, large city populations that are leaders in this space right now. Um, but as we surveyed all of them, um, we, we developed great confidence in our partners here in Dubai and we're grateful that they, they selected us as, as their partners as well.